Josh, is that you? Yeah, hang on one sec. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tatiana Show. Today is uh, December 15th, and I'm broadcasting to you live from my apartment here in New Jersey. I have to tell you, I'm really, really happy to be in New Jersey because as much as I love traveling around the world, um, there is no place like home, and there's no place like home when um, you finally had somebody to come over and help you clean. I'm really interested in keeping my apartment clean, but my actions don't belie this this desire. So it's I'm living in a constant squalor, um, shiny like battle between between good and evil. And um, and finally, Gladys came over and she helped me and she cleaned all these parts that I never even literally never even thought to clean. Um, so I'm very happy. I'm happy to be home. The holidays are here. I think I'm going to do a party at the studio this year, um, which is in Times Square. If y'all are in New York and you want to come, give me a shout. I can see what I can work out. Um, and it looks like we have Josh back on the show. Uh, it looks like he's muted right now. I'm not sure why, but he he's dying to talk to us and now he's unmuted himself you are re released upon everyone josh how are you doing today what's going on how is the holiday season oh it's great it's great I'm, it's the countdown to the cme um which is exciting because they're about to what's cme the well the chicago mercantile exchange um they they oh, are now i thought it was like the christmas merry well, it's, change. It, it's probably a very, <laughs> it's probably a very extravaganza to Jamie Dimon, who can now short the hell out of uh, Bitcoin. But the good thing is we'll be able to see when they do that because it's all public information. And uh, well, was that ever proven? Yeah. Remember when he remember when he like talked smack on Bitcoin, and then it went down, and then there were all these pictures of people saying that um, Chase bought a bunch of uh, Bitcoin right after. Was that ever confirmed as a real thing, or is that just a fake thing? I, I, I never saw any confirmations, but now that the CME is going to be opening futures contracts, uh, it's definitely going to be all in the open um, uh, because they have Can you explain to me what a futures contract is? Well, a futures What does this mean? What is this? Because I've been following this story. I know everybody's excited and stuff, and it's supposed to be a big deal, but I don't really understand what it is. And I bet you I'm not the only one. So what is what does this mean? So... <clears throat> The uh, a futures contract was originally uh, a type of way that a farmer, let's say a farmer didn't have the money to cover the seeds. It was almost like the first sort of crowdfunding uh, way. Like a little bit like food coin. Right, a little bit, right? So, so people, uh, the farmer didn't have the, the, the seeds for the crop, so he would sell the seeds at uh, the price now for the crop, but for the fu in the future. So he would, so then people would buy the crop at the price that it is now, uh, but pay him now. So, um, and and that, that that price was locked in. And then he would get that money or she, and then we'd make a crop and so it all turns out great. Um, but it also allows farmers to short the market, meaning bet on the way down, uh, because it's become a lot more, you know, it's not just a way of crowdfunding the future of, uh, of your crop now. And now it's, there's a whole lot of, tricky ways of, of uh, hedging anything. So let's say you've got a whole heap of Bitcoin and mm -hmm. what you can do is instead of selling those Bitcoin, you can borrow Bitcoin of someone else, sell them. And if, if, and that means that if Bitcoin goes up or down, you'll be, if it goes down, you'll win on the short side, on the CME side. And if it goes up, you win on the Bitcoin side. So you're stabilizing your holdings. I already hate this. This sounds very complicated. It sounds like a lot of weird gaming. Um, I don't know. Well, it is. Well, it it's is. Very I, I actually think there is a lot of. Sounds gaming. like gambling, don't you think so? Well, it's. I mean, all of all trading kind of gambling, but um, what I what I see, you know, is that the the, the guy, the people coming into you know chase uh, uh, to managers and say, hey, guess what? I bought Bitcoin to the all time highs. That, that person isn't going to get any any sort of promotions anytime soon. So how do you get them to buy Bitcoin, actual Bitcoin, at lower prices? Uh, well, I would say if they put in mega shorts around the world, plus dump a few real Bitcoins on the market, 
uh, they could cause a cascading crash. And then, you know, the, the, the might of these people. And we can't forget that, that banks and governments do not fundamentally like Bitcoin or crypto. I feel like this is the longest explanation for this ever. Well, it's what is the mercantile topic. exchange? People are just trading bitcoins around. That's what they're doing. They're trading them, and then if no. it goes up, they make more money. Like is that well, this is, or this the is future a, cost of bitcoin? Not even. Like yeah, they are, but they're not even trading actual bitcoin. They're just trading paper contracts. So the, it all is cash settled, which means no bitcoins ever have to be bought. Uh, they just put down deposits to cover any losses. But there never has to be actual Bitcoin. It's all betting on the price. So why is this good or bad? What is this doing for us? Well, we'll find out if it's good or bad. But uh, I have a feeling that there, there can be, it, it leaves Bitcoin open to a lot of manipulation. Not that, you know, Bitcoin has been void of manipulation. Uh, but it, it opens it up to institutional manipulation, which is on a far grander scale. So we'll see. Maybe they'll manipulate it up. I'm not really sure what I think about this. I think we should move on. Um, I guess, you know, if people have opinions on this, they can kind of weigh in and give us things. Hey, I think um, we should talk to our audience about something. Um, I think we should do more relationship questions on the show. What do you think of that? Do you think that we're talking to? I think that crypto is very nice and stuff, but I think that like romance conversations are more interesting so I'm not sure. I want to maybe change things up. So if people have any opinion about that or if they want to hear me sound like an idiot talking about the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and how little I understand what's happening there, they have their choice. Um, well, no, but what our I love first guest that. for today. Okay. What? No, go no, ahead. Do you have an opinion I, I, about this? Because I no, just agreed something and then I didn't ask you. Sorry, I, I love that you don't know anything about that because – a lot of our audience members don't know anything, so you'll be asking similar questions uh, than our audience members, and that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, well, anyway, what do you think? Should we do more relationship shows? Like, maybe people can write in. I don't know if it would be, like, the blind leading the blind, but maybe if people have advice questions. we, we got to think about it, but... Um, our next guest, or our first guest for today, we've got two guests. We've got uh, Sean Owen coming on from Salt. I met um, Caleb down at LubbockConf, and we were talking about Salt, and I was thinking I want to take out a Salt loan, so we'll talk about that, but not yet. Because first, ladies first, we have Carrie DePhillips, who's a really good friend of mine and a partner of Crypto Media Hub. She's the owner of The Content Factory, which is a digital PR uh, agency that represents several national brands. And she has a podcast called Workationing that she does with a mutual friend of ours, colleague as well, Kelly, and it's called Workationing. And it's exactly what it sounds like. They're working, they're they're hustling because they're hardworking ladies, but they're also vacationing because they're doing it in many, many different places. And I think today she's broadcasting to us from Amsterdam, um, where I'm going to be visiting her very soon, maybe looking into some business opportunities there. Uh, so Carrie, I think that you're on mute, but I'd love it if you could say hi to us and um, and welcome to the show. I think this is the first time you're on with us. Welcome. Am I unmuted now? You are unmuted and fabulous. I think this is the first step to uh, to show success is unmuting your microphone, I think. <laughs> uh, I, think I think that that's, that's the... You live in my I think family. you should totally do uh, some relationship stuff. Tatiana, I think that the people can learn a lot. Okay, wait, you know? so could we do that right now? Um, Okay, what are your tips and tricks? <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. We're just jumping right in here. We can talk My about tips crypto and, and PR. Okay. But top five dating tips for a first date. Go. And Josh, you also can weigh in. So from okay. we want a female perspective and male perspective. We're just testing this out here. What do you top think? Five, I think don't talk. Top five too. dating tips. Yeah, oh, God. Is, don't what? Don't talk too much. <laughs> no. Uh... Text the next day if you're interested. Oh, that's why. No, right? no, no games, straight in. I think Dude, a thank yeah. you ladies is appropriate. Don't give it up on the first night. I, I don't. I don't think that the lady should be giving it up on the first night. Call me old fashioned. No dick pics. I think that's a good uh, outlook. I, I don't understand. My boyfriend just came over and said, maybe, maybe have him give it up in the morning the next day, though. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, Josh, what do you think? Should should a lady um, give up her her charms? Is she uh, allowed to do that? Would you do any opinions? Strong strong opinions on that? Other than the obvious uh, one, which is yes. <laughs> oh, look! If, if they want to have a great night, a fun night, for sure, you know. But but if you want to set a proper relationship, I think it's good to you know just uh, see how each other's dynamics work uh, for a few days at least. <laughs> I've heard that men, that's how men relate, and that's how they decide if they're compatible with a woman. That's their way of showing love. Uh, it could be, yeah. Could no? Be. <laughs> well, you know, it depends on the people. It, it, it all depends. It's but a relationship like, show, obviously. It like, depends on like, the people. We're just trying to have generalizations. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I would say uh, definitely um, don't talk about crypto. Your first day. <laughs> Do not talk about what about libertarianism? I can yeah. confirm libertarianism is also not a hot topic. It does not tend to go over really? very well. I feel like those no. are leave politics. Yeah, those are my go tos. Leave, leave politics. What else is there? <laughs> Anything else? No, Anything I'm else? Uh, you you can talk I don't about have your. Anymore. <laughs> You can literally talk about anything else. The most I, recent time you've had craps, but don't talk about don't talk about politics, and certainly not your libertarian politics. <laughs> what if God, you guys are ruining every day I've ever had and every one I ever plan on having? <laughs> um, okay, fine. So, Carrie, tell us a little bit about workationing. How long have you been working on your podcast, and and what was sort of the inspiration? Were you doing something before that? Tell me about that stuff mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> so workationing was born probably about three years ago uh, in my head when I started to realize that I work from home so I can work from anywhere, but I, I don't. I work from my same stupid office every day, uh, my home office, but I, I could be working in cooler places. And so I got to thinking about that and I did a couple of test runs to see if I could really manage my business from the road and all of those, uh, I guess, test results came back positive. I did a few months in Europe last year, and uh, you know, nothing burned down. <laughs> and uh, as of January 1st this year, Kelly and I uh, packed our bags. We put all of our stuff into uh, 10 by 10 storage sheds. Hers is in Ohio, and uh, mine was in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, we started traveling the world. So uh, this year we've been to Puerto Rico, to Medellin, Colombia. We spent some time in Acapulco, some time in uh, obviously Amsterdam. I'm moving to Amsterdam, uh, Prague. We had just all kinds of different places. Saw so you in Las Vegas at Freedom Fest. What was your favorite place that you were at? Amsterdam, because mm, that's where you're moving? Yeah, Amsterdam. Puerto Rico was beautiful. Why is Amsterdam so great? Oh, it's uh, not they, anymore. Did you go no, there yeah. before the hurricane? Yeah. Yeah, we I, bet, I heard it was really, really messed up bad down there. Like, no, no bueno. It still is. A lot of people still don't have power. And that was, I think the hurricane hit September 20th. That's crazy. That's right. such a long time. Mm -hmm. But Amsterdam looks like something out of a storybook. And... Uh, the biking is pretty cool. I didn't think I was going to like it. Actually, the people here just seem healthier. They seem to have their shit together more, more so than in the U.S. Everyone uh, was exercising when I was there. It was, it was like you walk around and every there's like groups of people just exercising randomly. Yes. Every <laughs> it's the best looking people. I, oh, you need to come out here and and scope the guy situation. If you're single and looking to mingle, lady. <laughs> The Dutchmen, they have tailors. Yeah, I don't know why you would think that I would be single and looking to mingle. No, I'll, <laughs> I'll come out there. I, I I actually concur that the the men in um in Amsterdam were quite good looking. But I think that uh it's the aesthetic and the city has a really cool vibe. I didn't think it was going to be that cool. I thought it was going to be kind of like, okay, I get it. You can smoke weed, whatever, you know. Right. Um, But no, I really liked it a lot. So um, are you... Yeah. Um, so you're doing workationing. Now you're staying there. How long have you had the content factory for? Uh, I started it in 2010. It's a long time. Um, yeah. so 
a lot of people approach us and they want to do different ICOs. They want to do uh, crypto projects. They want to do PR stuff. Can you give us some kind of best practices, quick tips and tricks for people that are me planning on doing some sort of a launch next year? Because my, my tip is um, don't wait until two weeks before your ICO uh, before you make a call to some marketing people because I think that that's uh, a really big mistake and it puts the marketing and PR and social teams at a real big disadvantage. But I think most people um, expect that. They, they think that, oh, you're just going to call a couple weeks before and it'll be lickety split. But it takes a long time to get integrated with people. Um, what about you? What do you think? Uh, absolutely. I think that the sooner you can start thinking about your uh, PR strategy and your internal assets. So who on the team has what kind of skill set and what level of expertise and how can they be pitched to the media? How can your story be pitched to the media? How can your project be pitched to the media in a way that's going to make it stand out? I think that there is a, there's been a lot of negative press about ICOs and how ICOs are scammy. And certainly I've, I've seen some that look to be pretty damn scammy. Uh, and so differentiating yourselves from the less legitimate uh, ICO counterparts and really identifying what value you deliver to, uh, to the end user uh, and also to, you know, I guess your token holders too. Uh, so start thinking about all of that in advance and know that it's going to take uh, months to fully build out a strategy and A-B test uh, pitches and angles enough to identify what works or not. A lot of background that needs to be done on the front end before any of the pitches even go out in the first place. So I, creating and building up your marketing collateral and your brand story is really important and it's essential that you do so early on and you should be reaching out to a PR agency or at least building out your internal resources and really uh, prioritizing PR outreach uh, and social media outreach and a social media and PR and essentially digital marketing strategy across the board in-house if you're not going to do it externally. And if you are working with another agency, I would expect a minimum of like a month for from the time that you reach out to them to the time that you really start working with them and seeing pitches go out. It takes weeks sometimes to go through contract negotiations. And a lot of people who haven't worked with agencies in the past don't understand that it's not uh, call me and I start the next day kind of thing. There's a lot of background and due diligence that needs to be done on both sides in order to uh, create and then execute successfully any kind of digital marketing campaign. You're very wise words. There's so many, um, so many dodgy startups now that are doing ICOs, uh, well not dodgy startups, but dodgy ICOs, badly structured, and, and I think one of the biggest parts is getting exactly what you said, getting the, the, the notion and understanding the technology that you're building out through someone that can actually explain it properly and not just some uh, really uh, techie freak who can't communicate properly. Right, and communication is essential, and you're going to have, you're definitely going to want to have good writers on your team. If you don't have that on the C level, then you know hire it in because somebody's going to have to be conveying your highly technical message to pen to potentially less technically savvy invest investors. So factoring that in and boiling your language down into something that's easy to read, but then also adequately describes your project and what you're doing and how you're different is really important. So I, I would say that making sure that your website copy is uh, speaking to your audience in the way that you want it to is, is also really important. How, how much budget do you think your ICO needs for, for marketing in terms of percentage wise? How much do you think you should put away um, for an agency to deal with? Well, I can jump hey. in here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, generally, the rule of thumb that I've been told is one, uh, I'm sorry, 10% of what you want to raise. So that's a lot of money, obviously. But, you know, so if you want to raise a million dollars, you should have $100,000 set aside for marketing. Um, that would be spread between advertising, PR, um, and all the other goodies that go into it. 
What do you think, Carrie? I, I think that that sounds about right. I think that it's it's different uh, depending on. I'll just say that some things are easier to make go, as we say at my company. And make it go means you know get get good media coverage out of it or uh, achieve the overall objectives, exceed expectations. And Shin. some companies just have an easier time of that than others, based on you know the what they're offering. Uh, who their team is, and uh, you know what what their website and white paper and everything looks like. So it, it can be more expensive for some companies than others. But I will say that if your PR agency has been pitching you for like a, a couple of months and you haven't really seen any kind of progress, then you need to talk to them about their messaging and uh, potentially maybe find a, a better connected agency in your space. Because if you are try, I mean, in, in like six to eight weeks, you should be able to send out a variety of different of different pitches to your contacts. And if wave and the second wave and the fifth wave doesn't work, then I would recommend that uh, either your product isn't uh, pitchable, <laughs> uh, isn't media ready, as they say, or uh, maybe your agency doesn't have the contacts that that you think that they might have. And so, uh, if you don't see progress, and I would say like the three month mark, uh, it, it's really important to talk to your agency and figure out what their angles are and maybe revise and potentially find another agency. Does that, do you agree with that, Tatiana? I do, yeah, I think that that's, um, that's a good one. I also was sort of thinking about how people think that they're doing PR for themselves when they write a press release and then they use a automated service. My feeling is is that this is not an effective method of getting your news out there, but people really like it because they can write their own press release and then you know they pay three or four hundred dollars for the service, PRY or whatever it is. What's your experience with those kinds of services and do you think that they're effective? Uh, it, it's funny, if you were to Google press release distribution services right now, my website and blog post comes up number one for this. All right. And the, the title is why you probably don't need press release distribution services. And uh, in this article or in this blog post, I argue that most businesses do not need a press release distribution service. But what that's going to get you for out of 140, let's say, pickups, pickups, paste of your article on some like obscure back page of a bunch of different websites that nobody's ever going to see. Uh, those. Do you think that's SEO for that? The SEO value of that is zero, right. uh, and it has been for a while. Okay. So if you're trying to get SEO value out of press release distribution, you're you're uh, you're not going to get anywhere hoeing like that. Is the meme said? Uh, it, wow, that's bold. It's quite the statement. Right? It's true. It's true. Uh, so what I would recommend is, and you still want to cover your bases with that. That's going to definitely uh, get you in uh, Google search results, right? So I would recommend if you're going to go with one, don't go through PR web because that's going to cost you in the neighborhood of like three or $400. If you go through PR uh, underground, it's going to get you on Google News uh, when you search yourself. And it uh, generates pretty much the same results. The reporting is a little less pretty, but you're going to be saving some money on that. But as a whole, I find it to be a highly ineffective way of uh, generating earned media coverage for brands. The majority of our results is in uh, individually emailing the journalist directly. And that is something that... Uh, people can do in-house. They can certainly identify journalists that cover their industry. They can follow them on Twitter with the company accounts and with the CEO personal accounts, and they can kind of start getting on their radar that way. Uh, there are ways that you can find people's emails online, uh, build out your uh, media list that way, and then independently reach out. That is something that you can do. But if you go with a PR agency, the PR agency, uh, ideally, will have worked with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency clients in the past and have a large network of journalists that they've already worked with um, and have on a regular basis. So for example, at my agency, we have uh, reporters that we've worked with regularly at the New York Times, at CNN, and at Bloomberg, and you know a variety of others as well. 
But because we've had uh, you know a, a significant number of crypto-based clients, we we have uh, quite a few journalists uh, and relationships that we've built out. And again, individual companies can can do this on their own through their internal marketing departments, or even just a savvy CEO can implement the same kind of tactics. It just it's something that you should be doing, and if somebody uh, on an internal level isn't going to be focusing on it, I do think that it's absolutely worth outsourcing. Yeah, I think it's a lot of legwork, really. Um, and, and those relationships, building that out over the course of a bunch of years, I think is, is a little bit different than trying to cold call people. And even if you kind of do the research in advance. Um, right, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I have a question. So what's next in the, oh, go ahead, Josh. Do, do ICOs offer their tokens a lot of the time? Is it like annoying? Like, oh, you know, we'll give you X amount of tokens if you Is that something that's happening or is that is that changing? Are people getting used to that thing? Is that, is that a legitimate way of funding? A way of funding? It, it's something that's happening, but there are legal implications with that when it comes to selling. So that's something that I always run by my attorney who in most cases uh, says it's a hard no-go. <laughs> On that front, the deal needs to be organized in a very particular way. I usually don't, I, I'd rather have the cash in, in most cases. It makes the accounting a lot easier. Uh, my attorney likes it a lot more. There are exceptions to that rule, but I do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, see, this is where I think uh, VCs still fit into the picture. A lot of people say, oh, I see those means VCs are dead, but I think VCs are still gonna be used for the pre-ICO to get ready for, because to stand out from the hundreds of thousands of ICOs happening, uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, you, you need the money for the marketing, you need the money for yes. the lead, you need the money for the structure before, and to have a, at least an MVP as we start to move forward and more, more mature in that market. People want to see a minimal viable product and not just one paper. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and that white paper needs to be super solid. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many companies that have surprisingly large budgets have come at me, but their white paper has been something that like any journalist at all would read that and just be like, well, I, I can't cover this company. And then it hurts my legitimacy. It hurts my relationships or my team's relationships with mm. these journalists that they've built uh, to try and pitch these, you know, even if the, the product is, is legitimate and, you know, if that white paper doesn't make it look like it, then it, it's never going to get anywhere. So I would recommend that all of your marketing collateral, and I would include the white paper in that, uh, is error-free. It is comprehensive. It uses language that isn't, you know, just chock full of buzzwords. I think that that's, that's a mistake that a lot of ICOs make. Um, and, yeah, differentiating yourself means actually having an interesting and usable product. And I think that a lot of people, uh, or a lot of ICOs that I've seen, don't really pass that test. Mm. That's a harsh truth. But you know, it, market forces, right? I think we're going to see the best companies come to the top and certainly not all ICOs are scams. No, absolutely not, yeah. Okay, well, um, Carrie, if people wanted to connect with you, we're going to bring up our next guest, but I know that they can, what is it? Is it workationing.com or where can they listen to your podcast and um, your website and all that stuff? How can they connect with you? Uh, my website is contentfact.com, C-O-N-T-E-N-T-F-A-C.com. Uh, we are on Twitter and Facebook at contentfact. Uh, workationing.com is where you can find my podcast. We're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud, Stitcher. You can catch this around the internet. Kelly was just in Women's Health. Uh, that, that oh, really? Live. oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? She uh, was featured as somebody who lost the 85 pounds while traveling the world, is what the headline is. It's pretty impressive. I know how unhealthy food can be on the road. It is not my friend. Ah, it's so difficult. It's such a challenge sometimes. And out here, they've got the fries with mayo and no disaster. <laughs> That sounds very dangerous. <laughs> I look forward to participating and living on the edge with you when I when I come visit. Okay. Well, thank you for having me on the show, right. and I'll see you soon. So, Thanks very much, Carrie. Bye. See you soon. Great. Bye. Cool. So, um, I think so. Uh, we're about to bring on our next guest. I just want to give a quick shout out to the Bitcoin CPA, Kirk Phillips, who's been helping me dig through my torture 
Um, and our friends over at Crypto Compare, I've been using their site, comparing cryptos as, as uh, I like to do. Now I've been Christmas diversifying. Huh? I got a wonderful Christmas card from Crypto Compare. I did as well, actually, now that you mention it. So I'm really excited for our next guest because I've been hearing about SALT and I met with uh, one of the co-founders at La Bitconf in Colombia, where I was there for just two days uh, because of you know some travel issues. Um, but I was explained a little bit more about how this works because I've been thinking maybe I want to buy something, um, but I don't want to lose all my crypto. Let's say I want to buy some property. I was I'm kicking I'm kicking around the idea of buying an apartment in Poland at some point. Now, I would rather get it financed, right? I'm not going to use my cryptos. But then I started thinking maybe I could skip all the hassle and get something from Salt. So I'm excited to talk with Sean. Um, he is one of the co-founders. Oh, actually, let's let him tell us. Hold on. Sean, come on the show. Can you hit unmute? Because you're muted in my in my view. Hey, everybody. How are you guys? Can you hear me? Hey, Hello. nice to speak with you. How's it going? Yeah, it's good to be here. It's going great. So I see uh, you've been working um, in crypto since 2011. Tell me a little bit about what's happening with Salt. Are you the CEO there? I think so, right? Yes, I am the CEO and uh, co-founder. Kind of been involved since heard about Bitcoin in 2010, but really didn't get involved until 2011. Uh, and it's a long time. Yeah, there's a lot of history in between there. A lot of different projects and things I've worked on. But specifically now, Salt has been, we've been working for the last year and a half. There's things that led up to that were probably about two and a half years of work. But we've been, you know, really getting traction this year specific in 2017. Uh, so tell me about the trajectory. Um, did you guys, because I know that you guys are selling um, tokens on Bittrex and stuff. I can get them in other places. I think they're on Bittrex. I know that they're on Coin Market Cap, so I've been eyeballing it. And I wanted to get some Salt. So... But I can't actually use it yet, right? Can I not make loans yet? Tell me a little you, bit more about that. Yeah, so we uh, we are selling a tokenized version of our revenue stream, which is access to our platform and then internal currency. So there's really two use cases. One is like prepaid store of value, something you can hold that holds value that then is redeemable on our side for everything inclusive of the loans and the products and access, uh, hardware wallets and everything else we, we provide. Uh, and or you can spend it like the currency. So it's, uh, I think, easiest to imagine like a serial number for Microsoft or a a gift card that you would use at Amazon, where the di major difference is rather than a serial number, the recording is happening on a blockchain and that's being administered through the token uh, currently built on Ethereum. So, you know, we get a lot of people talking about that from the standpoint of the token. We, we really just refer to it as membership or access. Uh, which we think is unique because a lot of people have used tokens only for either, uh, you know, tokens really have only been used for fundraising in a lot of ways, or there's misconceptions. So you know, I like to get that out front and kind of describe what it is. Okay. So I want to use salt and I want to buy something for $100,000. How does it work? What do I do? Can I okay, do that so right now? Can I borrow 100 grand? You can if you talk to us privately. We're getting ready to launch, but we can't solicit publicly due to regulation. We so every every loan we've done, we've done several million dollars of loans. Uh, they've all been with parties who have gone through a little bit more extra process of vetting on depending on which side they're on, if they're the lender or the the borrower. Uh, getting through KYC, setting up accounts. So the first thing to do is just set up an account, uh, and then here very soon you'll be able to just apply. So you'll be displayed with whatever the lending rates are from lenders, and you'll be able to pick and choose and decide what you would like to, uh, how much capital that you need. There's perks and benefits for people who have paid prepaid further up. So you know the access, uh, the access level is kind of broken up into tiers. Uh, but then effect effectively, it's just a loan. It's a collateralized loan. So the major, the major difference that we're bringing to the table that doesn't exist currently in cryptocurrency is you can buy or you can sell and there's a lot of different ways to transact whether it's exchanges remittances sending to your friend speculating you name it but they all basically have one thing in common which is that you're either the owner of the asset and you hold it or you're not and somebody else does so what we're doing is we're creating smart contracts that allow you to go into a partnership or a contract with other parties who everybody mutually is holding the asset and then pointing towards it as collateral in the same way you would if you had an escrow agent on a home and a mortgage on a home 
you would treat that as collateral and then you take a loan out against it, uh, which is just not an option right now. It's an option in every other option asset class, but it's something new as a product, similar to kind of how futures are new. Those are kind of natural uh, progressions in markets when an asset class becomes, becomes more mature. We think that credit is kind of the next step and one of the biggest opportunities that we could bring to the space. So I have a, I have a question. Sorry, to just quickly. I've always thought it was a terrible idea to lend or borrow Bitcoin because it goes up so much. Like I'd hate to borrow Bitcoin off someone and have to pay it back in Bitcoin. But tell me how it's not a bad idea. So I agree with you that borrowing Bitcoin or lending Bitcoin is a bad idea. Um, unless you protect it with an asset. So an easier scenario would be imagine that you have Bitcoin and you don't want to borrow it and you don't want to lend it, but you need cash, you need euros, you need whatever, pesos, dollars. So Tatiana wants to buy a house. She doesn't want to sell her cryptocurrency. We can put that into a contract, prove that it's uh, legitimately can't be sold under conditions. And then a lender can say, okay, well, I feel good about that. So I'll send her the dollar bills that she needs to her bank account to go make the purchase. So it's different than if you were just borrowing and tra and or you know lending uh, something so volatile as Bitcoin. I think that's a terrible idea. And there's been other attempts at that, and they haven't worked out so well. It's the collateral nature of it that protects it that I think is key. I'm still confused as to how much it's going to end up costing me in terms of that. Like I want some, I want a real experience. I know that you guys are explaining it, and maybe I'm stupid, but. Let's say I want to, let's say I have a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. I'll put it into my thing. I take out, uh, how much am I allowed to take out of that? I think Caleb was telling me like 60 grand or something. Cause there's a certain spread that you can do. How much of that do I have to pay you guys back? Like, I, I still don't understand, but I want to understand. Cause it sounds like it would be a great way to not have to spend my crypto and still buy things, which would be great. Sure. So I'll give you, I'll give you a real world example and then I'll kind of walk you through uh, some some other additional examples theoretically, but most importantly to remember in in context here is that the lenders are going to set the terms and there's a market condition here, which is borrowers and lenders have to agree. So we we don't want to be a prime lender. We're more of a technology solution for lenders and borrowers in a network uh, to be able to to interact with different types of these uh, assets or currencies in smart contracts where they can be safe. We do lending out of default but that's to facilitate backup and for a, that's really for a structure, a legal structure for other entities or accredited investors to interact with. So keeping that in mind, it's all, the, the cost is all gonna be what you decide to choose and the competition of that then becomes, you know, what lenders will, what will compete down for. So for example, some people that are, are very unfamiliar with what blockchain or Bitcoin is, they're going to say, well, that seems really risky. I'll do it, but I'm going to need 15% interest or 20% interest. And somebody else is going to come along and say, yeah, I get this. That doesn't make it. I, I'm, I, I can do that. Just lower the LTV and I'll give you 10%. Right. And so over time, we think that that's going to become much more competitive and efficient as markets usually do. It's very inefficient right now. So it's probably going to be premiums paid. And I'll give you an example now. I took out a loan in February as a test case. It was one of the first ones to kind of prove this. And this is a product that I've wanted forever. Right, because I just hate selling my Bitcoin. And every year from 2011 to now, I've had to sell my Bitcoin from time to time or Ethereum or whatever else. And that's always really been frustrating because I feel like the day I sell it, the very next day it skyrockets. You know, it's just bad luck or something. But, um, you know, so I took it a loan for $25,000 and I put up 26 Bitcoin at the time that equaled $32,000. So that's an 80% loan to value. Uh, and I was paying 12% interest. Uh, so that Bitcoin obviously now is worth a lot more than $25,000 and I own, I only owe $7,000. So they get naturally less risky over time as you pay down principal and interest. Uh, but you will pay a premium on the interest. You have to then do the math and decide, uh, you know, am I more interested in the loss of the asset? You know, if, I, if I'm going short or if I'm long and I want to stay in my position, am I better off paying the interest to stay in this property? Does that kind of help? Somewhat. I think it's going to be a challenge helping regular people understand it. Um, I don't know, but I also don't have any experience borrowing and lending. And in general, I find finance to be mystifying. I oftentimes wonder what I do with crypto, but I think it's neat that, um, that you can empower somebody to actually get something that they want without spending their money. Right. Have you ever, um, have you ever, bought, uh, have you ever bought a car or uh, yeah. 
you know, or, or any stocks or any any kind of property. No, no so, but I bought a car once. Okay, so a car a car typically comes with a loan, and the loan is specifically tied to that asset, and they'll only give you a portion of that, right? Like you're still gonna have to make a down payment, and that down payment is gonna create a loan to value ratio that they're comfortable with. You know, knowing that it's cars typically depreciate, it's a little different, but it's the same idea, which is that I have a ten thousand dollar car. You need to put two thousand dollars down. That's going to be an eighty percent loan to value, and here's your monthly payments over five years. Plus, you're going to pay six percent interest, whatever, and that's the deal. And you sign for it. Now, the car effectively is yours as long as you pay off the loan. So just replace car with Bitcoin, and it's the exact same thing, but whether in reverse, which is I already have the Bitcoin, I already have the car, and I need eight thousand dollars because I'm I'm going to go pay for medical bills, or I'm going to go on vacation, or pay for Christmas, or whatever. And so you can leverage that because it's your property. Some of it, you're not good for it. I'll take the property. Fantastic. How is this something that you're going to be doing institutionally? Like, are you going to be doing, are you looking at this as a peer to peer lending platform or are there institutional use cases for this as well? Both. It's very institutional to start because the large, uh, large institutions in the Bitcoin space are like the big mining companies and big exchanges and people who are holding the most amount of cryptocurrencies, they're institutions. But then there's the, you know, then there's the individual uh, use case. And then it gets even more interesting when you think about when currency on the currency side, not being dollars, but maybe being digital currencies in the future, or even now, you know, somebody borrowing Ethereum based off of the Bitcoin holdings they have because they're a hedge fund and they want to use the Ethereum to go get into the next, uh, you know, ICO or whatever it might be. Right. So there's a lot of different use cases that are both institutional. Uh, ultimately, peer to peer is a concept that's. Um, maybe not always well understood you know even the even the big peer to peer lenders they're typically pool to peer or peer to pool and it can go both ways so they're syndicated meaning that there could be one big institution lending to many different people or many different people lending to one person uh, so peer to peer does have application but it's not always one for one it really depends and it really also depends on what's the currency what's the denomination where how how far does it have to travel is there forex exchange in between you know, there's a lot of different components, but in the long run, I do think that we will see protocol level kind of additions to blockchain technology that are going to allow for people to interact in ways they never have before, specifically with more advanced products rather than just buy and hold or sell. You know, having different options and different types of contracts is really interesting. Did you have a finance background before this? How did you come upon this other than suffering? I, you know, selling off the <laughs> cryptos over the years. And I totally uh, relate to I think it's like my favorite thing. I relate to that so well. Because it's so uh, rough. <laughs> I don't have a finance background in a, in a traditional sense. I got really wiped out almost in 2008. And I was I was all in on real estate and, and bonds, or, or rather mutual funds. And that was so frightening that I ended up kind of going the opposite way and started studying economics and studying finance and specifically got involved with gold and silver and hard money and like something that's not tied to the, the regulatory systems that exist or, you know, custodian systems that exist. And that was when I kind of heard about Bitcoin and got fascinated with that. So I've been kind of a student of as much economics, as much history and as much finance as possible since then. But I would say quite frankly, even though I thought I was educated before that period, I didn't really know much about how money worked at all. Uh, so so I'm not, I don't come from a finance background other than business investing and I've always been business operator and business manager or owner and uh, you know interested in financial investments. So the first time I heard about you guys was through Eric Voorhees and Shapeshift. Yep. Uh, how, where did they fit into the picture of Soul? So Eric is actually, I would credit him predominantly um, as much as possible for the idea itself. We were my three people, four people, Caleb, myself, Blake, and Eric had been at a, at a breakfast meeting, you know, as a meeting, we'd been looking at different cryptocurrency blockchain. Back then it was just Bitcoin. So we were just looking at Bitcoin businesses and ideas for many, many years. I'd met everybody kind of under the pretense of, hey, I'm looking to do business around Bitcoin. I need to find a really good idea. And we'd beat up a bunch of different ideas. And there was a specific conversation in 2015 where we were having coffee and uh, you know Eric said you know it'd be really cool as if I had Bitcoin and, and I could prove to somebody I had it and somebody would give me some cash and we just started talking about that and that was the, the light bulb for me went off I was like that's the problem I always have because literally the week before 
I'd gone to the bank and I had asked for a small loan. I only needed like $10,000. So they make you fill out a personal financial statement and you put down everything you own to the best of your ability to prove. You know, you typically try to prove you have a net worth that somebody should do business with you. And I put down Bitcoin and they kind of just negated that. And it almost like threw a red flag, like, well, we don't understand what that is, you know? And so it made it even diff more difficult than it should have, even though it's one of these things that you could prove that could exist. And so that's really where the conversation started, which is all these institutions are having problems with understanding custody and understanding how to hold this property and how to do it securely. And, you know, I'd been studying Bitcoin pretty profusely for a long time. Understanding multi-signature was kind of just becoming a new thing. And, and there was all these different features that were being discussed in the BIPs that were coming out of Bitcoin. And the light bulbs were going off like, okay, this could be something that is needed. You know, so it's an itch that I want to scratch. It's an itch that Eric wanted to scratch. And, you know, and we were having a conversation about it. So that was really kind of the genesis of the idea. And uh, that's probably why you heard about it from him. Yeah. Would you think banks, uh, you know, they're traditionally the institutions that <clears throat> profit from lending. Um, they obviously are way behind the ball on this. I mean, this looks, this is so futuristic and cool. Um, do you think eventually they'll catch up and start taking on this sort of domain? Yeah, I do through partners and people like us because we're going to make it palatable and, and rather than try to go reinvent this and hire a bunch of blockchain people to work at a bank which i could imagine is probably pretty hard uh i think that in the long run they're they're going to have to adjust dramatically to this technology you know you can you can see the implications coming whether it's national currencies being on blockchains or if it's you know some type of all-out kind of collaboration where everything merges or if it's a war who knows but what you definitely know is the value of the technology and how it relates to replacing a lot of the functionality and in institutions that currently exist so i think it's going to be very much a must for them to interact with this in a way and i don't think they'll do it until they have to but i do think that currently if you look at like the cme and you look at all the headlines and you look at just how much bitcoin is exploding into kind of the, the normal conversation every day now uh, that it's becoming much more okay to consider that and talk about it. I mean, we have a lot of conversations with banks often on a weekly basis, and they're they're very interested. They're not turned off. They're just they want to understand how it works, and they want to understand what the risk profiles are, and how we would then kind of tee that up as a back office solution for them to be able to interact with it. I find it so hilarious that banks are so behind. Uh, that's what they do. They are they focus on money. Like that, that's all they do is focus on money, and yet they don't they don't look and go, wow, there's a massive invention that's been around for nine years. I might put some effort into learning about this. Like until now, I mean, it's taken this long. I, I don't know why they weren't into it when uh, you know Satoshi first dropped his white why, why don't they have spies? Why would around? they be into it? This is ridiculous. Why would they want to have it. something that takes away their power? This is terrible for them. Right. They don't yeah, like it's this like, stuff. It's kind of like the, you know, the natural Nobody. bias. Everybody has a natural bias. If you're if you're a truck driver, you're not probably real comfortable talking about Uber taking your job away, right? And having trucks that don't have drivers. And if you're if you're somebody who works in the field and you're not that comfortable with somebody buying a whole bunch of new tractors that replace your job. So it's I true. think that there's I by a taxi driver the other day for saying that he should start learning how to program because self-driving cars are like around the corner and he's like, ah, he got really angry. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole out war on automated yeah. cars, right? Like yeah. people are really, really, they're really um, bent out of shape about it. And I think that's a defensive mechanism when people don't realize they could probably put their energy towards something better if their job was replaced. And that it always seems as a negative as like, okay, well, everybody else is still going to have a job, but I'm going to be replaced. So I think that it originally came out, Bitcoin, especially in the early days, was all about the libertarian views and the, the replacement of the bank and nobody was in control. That was the, the pretense before it became all about the price, which is what it is right now. And if you think about that, if you were somebody who just heard about this tiny little market cap that was threatening you, you'd be like, whatever, piss off. So I don't think it was taken seriously and or there's a defense mechanism there because of that very nature of just how human how human nature works when something's threatening. However, eventually you start to realize if it just keeps growing, 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 everybody keeps talking about it, like you have to kind of pay attention. Do you think that the libertarians are going to take over the world now? 
that we're rich or? Well, or I do think, think that we're that's... all gonna. Is it gonna be like Animal Farm, where the the pigs become just like the other? Some pigs are more equal, or whatever. The animals are more equal. Maybe not to that degree, but it is a really interesting thing, and I, and I'm a fan of thinking about a whole bunch of really rich libertarians. That yeah, that kind of makes too. me happy. I think that everybody has to treat us with respect now that whereas before they were all like they could just shit on us because we were all poor and now yeah. we're not so they have to be slightly more respectful but they still don't like it we're like the annoying new money yeah. <laughs> that's what I think it like, is how did but those with, get money? they're not supposed to have any money yeah well I like I like the shake up um, and I like when my guests are libertarian I have to say I shouldn't be biased but I am because I think this is one of the this is one of those things where it really draws um, it underlines how, how uneducated people are about basic economics. I mean, myself, I was as well. And if you have an understanding of economics, all this whole left, right nonsense totally fades away. It's just like, look, this is the objective. This is the best way to get to the objective. We've yeah. tested this out in multiple cultures. This is the one. So I don't know. I'm excited. I, I think this is cool. Will you walk me through a loan sometime? Sure. Yeah. I'll buy you coffee, maybe lunch, in fact, because it seems like it might be a little bit more drawn out than just over a coffee. But I, I would love to give it a try. Maybe. Um, well, you should do it if you're having already, in, you know, uh, just ma a, Making an account is really easy, right? Um, okay. Getting do I have to own really salt? Easy. You can come to, to salt without ever knowing anything about it and just purchase as you go. That's fine. So like if somebody it's designed to where it's kind of under the hood to a degree where somebody who has no inclination and doesn't care about the, the underlying technology and cryptocurrency can still interact with it. And they don't have to know that we're doing all the record keeping on the blockchain. Uh, and, and in fact, yeah, good idea. Too, you know, so it's kind of like the same as you can go to Amazon and do one click purchase. You don't have to know about the fact that they have gift cards, but you can also go online and you can go to gift and, or buy gift cards, secondary market for half the price. Right. But most people don't care about that. Some people do. So in the same way you could go have salt. However, if somebody gives you salt, I'll give you some salt and then you could start up an account, uh, you know, and then deposit that. Or you can just come from scratch and not need to know anything and start up an account and just borrow as if you were looking to use a service that's more fundamentally what you're used to i want to invest in the actual salt i like that too i mean i want to maybe do some lending and stuff but I, I don't know i'm always looking for new cryptos lately uh i feel like i just invited a whole bunch of unsolicited crypto suggestions <laughs> by making that one statement but uh no comment no comment but yeah <laughs> well no i met i met the prison people last week too so that was really neat I like I, I like all the shapeshift uh, and the shapeshift crew and and the buds of shapeshift. Anybody who kind of is like they're great. Yeah. So do I. Related so do I. or a okay? I am so stoked that you know Eric uh, for me is such a such a cool guy, such a lovely guy too, and such a smart, intelligent guy. And um, and you know I'm just so happy. It couldn't be happier. It couldn't have happened to a nice guy that he is that shapeshift now is officially the first crypto unicorn. Yeah, it's, a, it's. I mean, it's an amazing product. You know, it's an amazing product, and Eric's Eric's brilliant. Yeah, he's an excellent. Is it excellent a unicorn? Trader. I didn't know that. I well, the notification. Like over a billion uh, dollars worth of trades now. Yeah, they do an, an incredible amount of volume. Yeah, and the user experience is always excellent. And now they have Keep Key, by the way. So that's a good product as well. Oh, yeah. You know, I have a keep key somewhere in my house, and I don't know where it is. I need to find it. I never set check, it up because I. Out. You might not be able to see it, but you can buy salt branded keep keys that are going to be integrated. I don't know if you can see that, but they're beautiful. Ooh, so fancy! I want one of those. And you can link that to your salt account, right? You probably can't see the glare, but it's a really nice device. It's got salt on it. The display will show you what your balance is and everything. Yeah. Very right. very nice. You can buy them from salt. All right, so. Cheaper, you know. Really? Okay, good. Wait, where do we get them for cheap? Uh, saltlending.com slash shop. There you go, guys. That makes a really nice Christmas present. There you Teach go. people how to loan themselves money. Um, thanks so much, Sean, for coming on the show. I hope I get to meet you in person sometime. It was really neat hanging with Caleb, albeit briefly, in uh, Columbia. But um, any final words? Where can people catch up with you guys? Saltlending.com is the main website. Are you on your socials? Are you doing any kind of talks anytime soon? 
Yeah, we're um, you know, I, we just barely missed crossing past there in in uh, La BitConf, so I'm sure I'll see you around sooner or later on the same channels and some of these conferences. We travel quite a bit, you know. Right now, we're really focused on just staying as much as we can notice the grind on the product itself and we've got some really exciting things coming so i would say the main place is definitely just saltlending.com make an account it's very easy uh, otherwise we do have social we do a blog we're keeping people up to speed on telegram and slack and a bunch of other places so we're pretty easy to find uh there's some bad bad news out there always there's some channels that are not us there's unofficial channels etc but the official ones are all pretty easy to find so we'd love to chat with you it's great talking very to you. good very cool. Thanks so much. We, we had a good time, Josh. I don't know if we're going to do a show next week, but if not, people can catch up with me on TatianaMrose.com or get their PR marketing stuff going at CryptoMediaHub.com. Um, Josh, what, any any words? Can people buy each other gold with Futuro this year, or what's the story? No, we, you can't. Uh, you can't be. Well, you could send uh, money to a Bitcoin address on Voltoro and it'll buy gold for sure. But um, uh, yeah, if you if you guys want to take some profit off the table uh, and wait for uh, some sort of correction in this crazy, crazy market, uh, buy allocated gold. Um, Altura, that's what we offer. We're a full marketplace, fully insured and fully audited by one of the largest auditors in the world. It's allocated, so even if something happens to us, uh, liquidators can't touch your asset. Um, and uh, and then trade back into Bitcoin when it when it's when you think it's the bottom. It uh, can't get any better than that. Um, and if you want to follow me um, at Voltoro, that's Volt as in Gold Vault and Oro, which is standing for gold, believe it or not. Excellent. All right, everybody. If we don't see you before Christmas, Merry Christmas. Hope you have a nice holiday. Otherwise, um, I don't know. Stay tuned. I'm in town for a while, so we'll be doing a lot more shows, which will be neat. Uh, I like chatting with everyone. All right. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Sean. Thanks again, Carrie. Thanks, Josh. And uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.